I feel like Oprah and the book club. Uh, it's pretty funny. We continue to get more and more emails about uh, helping loved ones get sober and different things. And so I'm always looking for, for new content, new um, help, videos, books. And I just devour the stuff and look to put it in a kind of like a little compressed bite-sized bit that I can share with other people. Um, it, and this book's pretty decent. I, I've read this, it's called Get Your Loved One Sober. There's a few different um, authors, but I just wanted to go over and kind of give my breakdown. These are my personal notes that I wanna share. If you end up reading it and get additional notes, I would love to hear from you because I'm always looking at learning more. And when I read books multiple times throughout different years, it's amazing at how many times, even though I've had the same book in my hand, they add up content every single time I read it. I say that jokingly, but I'm always learning these lessons. And so, in this book, Get Your Loved One Sober, it's interesting. Some of the tactics uh, are fantastic. We actually utilize a lot of them here, but I wanted to share the information. So I'm gonna go off my notes and make it uh, as interactive as possible. <laughs> so they talk about what they call behavioral mapping. And that's figuring out how you and your loved one, the addict, actually affect each other and how that pattern may be modified to achieve different results. By the time we read stuff like this or reach out, we've tried many, many, many times and we're not uh, achieving the results we're looking for. And so this really does a good job of getting in there to see, okay, what is my part in it and how can I help continue my growth independently from whether my loved one who is, is um, suffering from addiction is actually able to grow as well. And so one thing that I really liked of this, it says, the objective of moving your loved one towards sobriety is greatly helped by improving the quality of my life independent of their behavior. A lot of the times we tend to throw it together. And as I look at, well, what is my part and how do I grow independently, whether they are ready or not, or whether they are seeking growth or not. And so by being independent, this leads to a less reactive manner on my part. And that is where I start using alternatives. And so this is a very difficult part because a lot of times people will think of there's blame and that's not what I'm talking about. We want to remove the blame, but I want to ensure in my journey, I am getting healthy and learning how to use alternate methods independently from them. And ironically, it's, it's kind of like, oh gosh, who, who was it? I forget what it was. I heard this say not too long ago and they said this person's um, this person's always singing, they must be happy. And the person said, no, I'm actually happy because I'm always singing. And we tend to get the order flipped. And so as I get healthier, ironically, more times than not, they eventually start seeing that and by leading, by example, or role modeling, and a lot of the times it comes with setting healthier boundaries as well, they will start to get better. <clears throat> so here we go. So it's called the map. And so I believe there's three steps. So number one is learn their using triggers. Reasons for using such as events, thoughts, and feelings, such as stress at work, nervousness, um, complaints, different things like that. So the first thing is learning triggers. So we become more aware of when, something, when there's a stimulus that's actually triggering for the individual. And then we learn using signs, such as when they're under the influence, they speak louder, jaw clenched, uh, multiple complaining. And so a lot of this is recognition through awareness and raising that awareness level so we become more effective. And then establishing and recognizing the consequences, both bad and good. Many times people look at consequences as just merely negative consequences, but there's actually positive consequences. Um, this goes in depth with a lot of examples, negative such as missed work, loss of pleasure, uh, and then the positive of what happens of uh, relationships growing, getting to go do fun things. And so focusing on the biggest takeaway was replacing replacement methods, um, such as helping them relax. It's a new coping method. Uh, Charles Duhigg wrote a book, The Power of Habit, which talks about cue, routine, reward. And almost everything we do in life is actually habitual. We, we become, um, I don't wanna say sedated, but we fall into these patterns of habit. And so this really talks about replacement methods, basically putting in when the cue happens, putting in a new routine, which will lead us to a new reward and it breaks that habit or replaces it with a new habit because we're consistently moving towards our habits. 
And so um, the roadmap is the tool that you use to figure out how the triggers and consequences work together and how to change. And again, it goes more in depth, but I want to at least give you some nuggets so you can make a decision if you want to read and, and go further, or if it's just kind of uh, simple information that you can go ahead and take in. And so part of the process is actually describing the vision of a perfect relationship with the addicted person from a positive aspect. So many times we seem to focus on the negative, but describing of what it could look like from a positive aspect and using positive requests such as, I really appreciate it when you take off your boots before coming in. Um, uh, it makes my job of cleaning much easier. Basically, it's positive reinforcement of when they do this and your benefit from it as well as theirs. And so you can input whatever example comes to mind for you, but using this positive request tends to make the process a little easier and, and more palatable, if you will. So making positive statements, so here's an example. Instead of saying, I hate it when you drink, say, I love it when you stay sober. So we're saying the same thing, but when we go negative, it tends to put a person in a reactionary state and it's more of defensive, the fight or flight. When we put it in a positive state, it's positive reinforcement. There's another book, which I'll probably do this, it's called Don't Shoot the Dog by Karen Pryor, and it's incredible. It's actually about positive reinforcement with human condition as well as animals and how it correlates. Um, I won't go too far down the rabbit hole, but that one was fantastic about positive reinforcement and what that looks like. Um, let's see, where did I leave off? So reinforcing the positive behavior with rewards they desire and punishing bad behavior and ignoring unwanted behavior. And so we wanna make sure when they do well, we praise, when they don't, we um, ignore the negative behavior, pull ourselves from and continue. And that's why this book really stresses on the independent growth on my side whether or not the, uh, the addict that I love and care for isn't. And so they said the try it, you'll like it approach, focusing on one small aspect to change and show them that you've changed something important to them as well. And so here's an example. Lately, we just haven't been on the same page. I'd like to spend some time with you just talking about our relationship. Can we set aside 30 minutes tomorrow night to talk? Um, just little things like that to actually help engage. So when we sit and talk, it's not this negative experience all the time, but actually looking to connect so we can share our emotions and feelings with them. And then finding out this part is a big, big part, finding out their why they use. Why do they use? What are the positive effects that they get? We tend to on the outside just see the negative and forget how strong the positive is for them. Uh, I remember actually helping a gentleman uh, work through his sister was struggling, um, was, I wouldn't say in denial, but very resistant because she was functioning. And so I tried to explain it to him in terms he'd understand. And it was interesting because I said, what is the most valuable thing to you that you would literally give your life for? You would do whatever it took to, to achieve that state or to be in, in that experience. And it was interesting because he said, you know what, it's, it's my time with God. That's more important. Even though I love my family unconditionally, that's the most important thing in my life. And I said, what would happen if someone came in into your life, someone you love, and you felt judged and they said, hey, listen, you can't spend time with God anymore. And that was enough to shake him. That was enough of going, he said, oh my gosh, I never realized how important this is to them. I was coming from an outside standpoint of not, not uh, consciously, but kind of judging of how could you do this? It's tearing the family apart, there's so many consequences, and didn't think of what they're getting out of it. And so that seemed to really resonate with him. And the reason why I bring that up is because when we're able to see, we are asking this person to, to stop and to quit the most loved possession that makes them feel the best. Another person um, said it this way, I use because it feels like I'm being hugged by Jesus. That is a powerful statement. Um, and that's real serious stuff and going, oh my gosh. So I can see to this person, we're looking at telling them they can't do something that they have linked all the senses, sight, sound, um, the kinesthetics, everything together. And that's why addiction is so difficult because it links and it's this positive experience for the person. A lot of the times we don't associate all the consequences that come later with it. So as we understand that it helps, it helps us come from a place of emphatic listening and more, more, uh, empathy to sit there in vulnerability and say, wow, I really am asking you to do something that brings you so much joy, not just at a physical level, but emotional. I mean, it's, it's, it's so convoluted. 
And so as this individual understood that, it was like this light bulb went off because he said, I never thought of it like that for her. Our whole family has kind of shunned her and judged as opposed to saying, wow, we are asking you to give up the most important thing in your life that you are, I mean, she kept leaving her child to go use. Uh, and it's hard to come from a place where we're not judging, but to remove that judgment and say, wow, this must be so important, the fact that a person would abandon their child to go do this. And as we recognize that, we're able to come into that place of knowing, uh, there's a saying, hurt people hurt people. And knowing this person has to be so hurt that they're willing to do this. And later when they're thinking rationally, they go, oh my gosh, I would never do that intentionally. I can't believe I'm doing this. And so by understanding that why they use the positive effects they get is when we can look at replacing with equally satisfying effects that are not destructive. So I, I know in theory it sounds so simple, this replacement method, but of really understanding and, and cutting down to it, of what else they can do that really feels good, um, preferably as high or higher than that level or at least close to, and then sitting down and making an exhaustive list. That is a huge part that this book really dives into is that replacement method and how effective it can be. And so that is why the self-help uh, book for addiction, Get Your Loved One Sober, I would definitely say it's, it's worth a glance over. I'm hoping that helps. And if you have any other questions, you can go ahead and shoot us an email.